Welcome to the first ever virtual edition of United for Libraries Gala Author Tea, sponsored by Reference USA. This event has been held for more than 10 years at both the ALA Midwinter Meeting and ALA Annual Conference, and we decided to continue the tradition by making this year's a virtual event. We would like to thank Reference USA for their sponsorship of this tea, and we'd like to recognize United for Libraries board member Steve Laird, president of Reference USA, for his longtime support. United for Libraries would also like to thank the platinum and gold corporate friends that made this event possible, Penguin Random House, Harlequin, HarperCollins, and Ingram. Please check out those book buzzes and um, that these and other publishing sponsors did over the virtual event. They're all on the United for Libraries Facebook page and you guys, your to be red stacks are just gonna go through the roof. I'm warning you now. And for those watching tonight on the Facebook live stream, we'd love to give you a warm welcome. Because we're making this year's event accessible at no cost, we encouraging those of you watching right now who are able to donate to your local Friends of the Library group or Library Foundation. Libraries need our support now more than ever, and a donation will be a great way to show your appreciation for these writers who are sharing their time and talents with us today. Today's gala author tea is the final program for the United for Libraries virtual event, which brought together more than a thousand participants, library trustees, friends of the library, those with library foundations, as well as library staff and directors. We also want to thank United for Libraries President David Page, United Board, United's Programming Committee, and all the presenters and member leaders who made this possible. All of the virtual event sessions were recorded and their reach will go into the thousands, accessible by those with United for Library statewide access. The keynotes, including an amazing session with Simon Sinek last night, which you can view on the United Facebook page, along with programs on equity, diversity and inclusion, advocacy, outreach, and so much more, demonstrated the extraordinary efforts of individuals and groups on behalf of libraries. And we truly are stronger together. We really look forward to making this an annual virtual event. So now I would like to introduce the moderator for today's tea, Barbara Hoffert. Barbara is editor of Library Journal's Prepub Alert and a longtime supporter and friend to United for Libraries. So Barbara's gonna kick off the program by introducing our amazing lineup of authors. Then she'll be moderating the Q&A after we hear from them all. Welcome, Barbara. Okay. Thanks very much and I wanna thank first United uh, for Libraries for putting together a wonderful virtual tea. What a great idea and thank you also for giving me so many good authors to read. I appreciate that. So I wanna give a quick description of each book, introduce you to each author, and then we'll hear from each of them in turn. Um, our first book uh, will be from Daniel W. Moniz, who offers a debut collection, Milk, Blood, Heat. Um, whose individual stories have won multiple awards. And not surprisingly, uh, these are stories of relationships and longing that used direct, if luscious language to nail aching moments of naked human emotion. A woman unable to recover from a miscarriage is plagued by strange visions. A teenager rebels against her pastor's veiled aggressions. A man whose wife is dying of cancer struggles with his own shortcomings. These are all stories you'll want to read. Our next author will be Sarah Penner. The Lost Apothecary is a debut novel, buzzy enough to be set for translation into about a dozen languages. It enticingly weaves together two storylines as Caroline flies to London for her 10th wedding anniversary without her cheating husband. She's there to discover herself, but while mudlarking along the Thames, she also discovers an old bottle that leads her to the story of late 1700s apothecary Nella. Nella dispenses poison from the back of her shop for the benefit of women only, and records these transactions as the one way these ordinary souls might be remembered. Feisty young apprentice, Eliza is there to help as catastrophe strikes. So, a walk through history, a portrait of women helping themselves, and a mystery we unravel along with Caroline. Good reading. Then next up, we will have uh, Syed Masood, who has moved through citizenship in three countries and residency in nine cities, which may explain the energized tone of the bad Muslim discount, if not its coruscating wit. 
In this debut novel, um, Anwar's mother and brother remain rigorously devout after the family flees Pakistan's surging fundamentalism for California. But Cheeky Anwar has his own ideas. At 14, he finds a soulmate in Bookworm Zuha. Years later, as a lapsed lawyer, he still says, do I admit to being a bad person? No. I will, however, admit to being a bad Muslim. At that point, he's helping Aza, who's tough and wily enough, despite a crushingly strict father, to have maneuvered them both out of Baghdad, even as Trump rises. How to be brave, how to grab the wiggle room fate affords, these are the things readers learn along with Anbar. And as the Star LJ Review says, Masood is a born storyteller. Next author will be M. O. Walsh, who's following his New York Times bestselling debut, My Sunshine Away, with the Big Door Prize, set in a small Louisiana town. There, folks are falling over one another to try the local grocery store's new uh, Dynamix machine, which promises to tell users their life's true potential for two bucks and a quick cheek swab. You know, it's kind of like, was I really meant to be a cowboy? Maybe. Teacher Douglas Hubbard is a doubter, while Sherilyn is curious, but both are ready for change. Meanwhile, Jacob discovers uncomfortable truths about his deceased twin, and he realizes that he has his own choices to make. So look, is the dynamic scene for real? You've got to read the book to find out. But one thing you'll learn from this wry and affecting narrative is that when it comes to life, we have to grab the reins ourselves. And our final speaker will be uh, Ruman Alam, who's author of the beloved novels, Rich and Pretty and That Kind of Mother. He's expanding his horizons and ours with the edgy and edge of seat, leave the world behind about a recognizable New York professional couple departing the city for some downtime with their children at a rented house on Long Island. They go on the defense when a man and woman claiming to be the homeowners appear saying they fled the city because of a blackout, though in the absence of TV and internet, who knows what's happening. For different reasons, the characters all think immediately of their safety first, but events proved to be much larger than they had imagined. And that's precisely the point because as to quote the author, he highlights our failure of imagination regarding the consequences the way we live today. It's not Twilight Zone-ish, it's unsettlingly real. So those are our five authors, and we are going to start with Dantiel. I, Dantiel, I'm turning it over to you. Tell us about your sparkling new collection. All right, thank you so much um, for the introduction. Um, for anybody who's new, I'm Dantiel. Um, I'm honored to be on this panel with these authors and especially presenting to librarians. Um, you know, growing up, my mom couldn't always afford new books, especially at the pace at which I consumed them. So like, you know, being introduced to the public library around six or seven um, was like mind blowing to me that we could get all of these books for free and they would just like, let me take them home. Um, so my like profound librarian story was, you know, I'm sitting there with my new library card trying to figure out which book I want to take, you know, just agonizing over it. And this librarian comes up behind me and was like, you know, you can check out up to 20 books. So um, my mom was maybe like, don't tell her that, but it was, it was such a great moment for me. So to think that, you know, my book could possibly be available, be available for checkout in a library is like one of the highest honors for me. And I think it brings everything full circle. Um, so I'm going to talk about Milk Blood Heat, which is my debut collection. I was lucky enough to get a galley um, a couple weeks ago, which is really cool to be holding it in print. But um, so this is a collection of 11 stories and it's set in and around Florida, but specifically Northeast Florida. Um, I think people mostly think of, I mean, obviously in this current moment, I know what people are thinking of when they think of Florida, but like current moment aside, um, I think most people think of Disney World or places like Miami when they think of the state. And there's a lot that gets left out of that um, imagery. So it was important to me to set these stories around my hometown. Um, I wanted to see where I grew up portrayed on the page, which, you know, I don't often see. I also don't think that um, people see Florida as a literary state, but there's so much genius that comes out of here or has been written here. Like if you think of authors such as Zora, Zora Neale Hurston or in Ernest Hemingway and Elizabeth Bishop, not to mention contemporary writers such as, um, you know, Karen Russell or Kristen Arnett. So there's a lot going on and it's important for me to illuminate, you know, what the Florida literary scene has to offer. But uh, back to the book, 
I think that when people hear linked story collection, they mostly think of stories that are following the same set of character, which I think leaves the subtler bonds of place, voice, and theme, or other ways that stories can be connected kind of out of the loop. I do think of this collection as linked, um, definitely by place and theme, but also by situations and words that I think of as totems that kind of resonate throughout each story and pick up strength from the first story to the last story. I think that all these stories are in conversation with one another in ways that echo, that use echoes and mirrors. And I think that highlights the connectivity we experience as humans. So I'm really excited for people to finally be reading these stories. I also think of these stories in the vein of Bildung's Roman. So like when you hear um, coming of age, people are usually inclined to think of it as a singular event. For example, the transition from age 12 to 13 or 17 to 18. But I would argue that as long as we're, li we're living and we're receptive to growth and um, learning that we're always coming of age the entirety of our lives. And I think that's really important to consider. Um, so in the title story of my collection, Milk Blood Heat, there's a 13 year old girl who's kind of coming into awareness about herself. But in a separate story, um, there's a 58 year old retired car trucker who's also doing that same thing. And so I think that coming of age is nothing more than a realization or a discovery about ourselves or the world. So these stories are interested in that moment. And, you know, does the character accept this new knowledge that they've learned or do they turn away from it? And what are the consequences of either choice? Um, Let's see. So a little bit about the process of writing the collection. Like novels, short story collections can take years to write. But additionally, with short stories, you may not even know you have a collection and what you're writing towards until you have several stories. So for me, the oldest story in this collection was written in 2012 during my senior year in undergrad. And I didn't, you know, I didn't think like, oh, I'm, I'm writing a collection. For me, I was like, oh, I'm writing a, a story assignment. This is something that you know, I wrote and I put it away for several years. And then when writing kind of like didn't let go of me, I came back to it. And when I got into my MFA, I wrote some of the rest of these stories around 2016 to 2019, but it took me until I had four or five of them to realize that generally I was circling around like the same obsession with each story. And the question that it amounted to was, am I a good person? And because good is a value judgment, it can't exist without its opposite. So then it becomes the question of who gets to define good or bad and can this morality be situational? And so that's kind of how this collection was born. I just leaned into an obsession. Um, so I think that's one of the really cool things about being a writer is that you get to explore your obsessions on the page in a way that might illuminate something for a reader, which is really cool. Um, one thing that I'm hoping to achieve with this book is to kind of shift the discourse of how short stories are valued compared to the novel. Um, I think it's very common to hear things like, oh, you know, short stories are for MFA programs or that people don't read or don't buy story collections, which I don't think is necessarily true. And especially over these last few years, um, especially if you're looking at collections that have done really well, like as far as critical acclaim, if you're thinking about her body and other parties or lot or lucky man or even Florida, you know, by Warren Groff. So I think that it's just a matter of changing the discourse and kind of getting people to understand what the value is in a short story and not just kind of be like, oh, it's this brief thing. So that means it has less of an impact. It's been such a thrill for me to create these deeply immersive worlds in the span of like 10 or 20 pages. And I think it's really powerful that something so brief can stick under the skin. And so, you know, that's my will for these stories, that they find the people who need to read them and that they stay with them. So, that's it. That's all I got. Thank you, Dantil. That was terrific. Um, I can't wait to dig more into the process that you're describing and, and get to value it more. Thank you. So our next author is going to be Sarah. Uh, um, Sarah, if you can come on the screen, and I want to find out all about the research process that you went through to emulate the research that your author did, that your character did. Yes, thank you so much, Barbara. I'm so thrilled <clears throat> to be here tonight. And when I first got the list of panelists for the other authors on this call, I was very much humbled and honored that my publisher had somehow gotten me on this fantastic list uh, because as you so eloquently noted at the start of this call, 
this is my debut novel. Um, I, I don't even have any, you know, publication in Wall Street Journal or, or New York Times. So I'm thrilled that the reception, the early reception for The Lost Apothecary has been so wonderful. So I'm, I'm very excited and appreciative to talk to all of you tonight. Um, I am tuning in from St. Petersburg, Florida. So that's something Dantiel and I have in common, uh, which I think is pretty neat that we are both located in Florida. And as she said, it's a bit crazy down here, um, but we, I'm staying healthy. So I hope that everyone on this call is as well. And I'll be honest, one of the challenges that I had when kind of putting my thoughts together for tonight was what tea do I make for myself, especially given that my story takes place in London. So I ended up uh, just getting a chamomile lavender tea but of course I'm, I'm presenting to a number of people that I've never met before. So I also had to pour something a little bit stronger. Um, I know Imo said he's got something with vodka, so I do as well. I've got two, two beverages here in front of me. Um, so about the lost apothecary and Barbara, I promise I will answer your question about some of the research that went into it. But first I just wanna start with what the lost apothecary is about. And as you mentioned, Barbara, it is about an apothecary in 18th century London who sells well-disguised poisons to only women who want to seek vengeance on <clears throat> the men who have wronged them. And, <clears throat> excuse me, her vial, one of her, uh, her vials that carried some of her poison is actually discovered 200 years later, present day, by my character Caroline, who is mudlarking on the River Thames. And mudlarking is a word that uh, very possibly some of you have not heard of. I had not heard of it prior to um, several years ago. But mudlarking essentially means scrounging around in the mud of the river looking for interesting historical artifacts. So this is exactly what happens. My present day character finds an old apothecary vial and ultimately ends up chasing down this 200 year old unsolved mystery. So it was so fun to write and research. And part of that is I think as writers, we um, often put a little bit more of ourselves into our characters than we'd like to admit. And there is a lot of me and Caroline in that she is enamored with old London and old documents and old secrets that have been buried and left behind. And so she spends a lot of her time in the British Library. And that's one of the reasons I was most excited to be invited to this event tonight is some of my early readers have been librarians, of course. They've gotten their hands on the advanced copies and they all have said how much they love one of the main characters in my book who is a librarian at the British Library. And she, particularly loves looking through old maps. So <clears throat> when I was researching and drafting this novel, I did go to the British Library and uh, reviewed a number of old documents, everything from old apothecary ledgers to um, John Roke's map, which was uh, probably one of the most famous Lon uh, London maps pulled together in 1746. And then just a number of old journals and firsthand accounts um, to really better understand the terminology and, and the types of things that a druggist or apothecary in 18th century London might have written down or might have um, spoken about with their contemporaries. So it was definitely a, you know, a huge joy to write and to research. Um, the Lost Apothecary is actually the second book that I have written. Um, my first book is never agented, never published. And I think it's been so interesting to talk to aspiring writers and um, querying writers about this process because my first book ever was rejected by 130 agents. So I definitely built a thick skin. And then the Lost Apothecary, I was thrilled to receive five agent offers on. Um, so it was, it was very much uh, well received from the get go. And we were thrilled to sell to Park Row overnight in a 24 hour preempt. Um, and I think there are a few different themes that contributed to that fantastic reception. So hands down, the number one theme 
running through the story is this idea of women banding together to support and honor one another. And sometimes that's via uh, bad things. I mean, obviously the book is about poison and about um, murder. So that's, that's maybe not the best route to seek vengeance. Um, but there's also a lot of really heartwarming ways that the women in my story come together to honor and support one another. And so it's really, uh, there's a lot of contrast in there. You've got the apothecary who's very much grieving and vengeful. Um, but 200 years later, my other character, she kind of processes her grief in a different way. And so I really wanted to show that difference between the two characters. Um, and ultimately how women can save each other despite the barrier of time. Another thing about The Lost Apothecary that I think has contributed to its great early reception is the fact that the book is just fun. So, you know, when we hear the word apothecary, it's very atmospheric, it's very um, just kind of compelling and alluring. A lot of retail shops now are putting the word apothecary in their in their brand name just because they, they know that will bring customers in. And really not much has been written and published about apothecaries. And so I really wanted to immerse the reader in this sinister um, hidden shop kind of behind this closed cupboard door and let the reader peek into almost in a voice voyeistic way you know the sinister things that are happening in this apothecary shop um so it was very fun to write and there's also as barbara alluded at the beginning there's some sleuthing we get to follow the present day character as she kind of hunts down this mystery in this apothecary and um, realizes quickly that not all is what it seems and that uh, this apothecary is not all that she seems. Um, so it, it was, as I mentioned, so much fun to, to write and I think we all are looking for something to escape into. I hope that my readers learn something new when they learn about mudlarking, when they learn about the countless um, herbs and ingredients that the apothecary uses to concoct her deadly poisons and the very interesting disguised ways uh, that her clients ultimately um, give them to their victims. So I think, you know, I've had a lot of people say I, I had no idea that these household ingredients could be kind of concocted into something so dangerous, but um, I did a lot of research on uh, herbs and different um, you know, different medicines. So I think my goal is that readers will, will enjoy themselves while they read it. They'll learn a few things, definitely about old London. Um, but then again, as I mentioned, it's such a story about women controlling their fates and their destinies. And so that's really the main takeaway that I hope my readers have when they turn the last page. That's all I've got. Thank you, Sarah. And the research shows up, but then you go so far beyond it with two very interesting storylines, which I like because often when I read a book with two different storylines, I find myself liking one a whole lot more than the other, but that didn't happen here. I enjoyed each of them and wanted to get back to the other at every moment. So um, appreciate this and looking forward to your next book. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Sarah. And our next author, uh, Saeed Masood, um, Saeed, I have to tell you, you made me laugh the whole time I read this book. So let's see if you can do it again um, as, we're, as you're talking on screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here completely across the country from in Sacramento, California. Um, so uh, The Bad Muslim Discount is my debut adult novel. My uh, first novel, which is YA debuted two days ago, so I'm still running high from that. Um, but uh, I want to talk about the title of the book because that's the first thing everyone asks me, the bad Muslim discount, what does that mean? I get a lot of side eye from Desi uncles and aunties that I know in the community, you know, sort of wondering if I'm going to make them look bad. Um, <laughs> and so I have to explain to them, you know, the, the job of an artist is to tell the truth, not to paint a rosy picture um, and to tell the truth while being hopefully entertaining. In, in my case, I try to be funny. Uh, it works sometimes. <laughs> um, 
So the title comes from the setting of the book towards, towards the end of the book, the later half is set in San Francisco in 2016. And uh, you have a um, older um, Pakistani gentleman who has uh, a apartment building called Trinity Gardens. And when Muslim renters come to him, he judges them and he declares them to be either a good Muslim or a bad Muslim. And then he gives you a discount, either the good Muslim discount or the bad Muslim discount. Uh, in this case, he gives one of our protagonists, Anwar, uh, the uh, good Muslim discount. It turns out Anwar is not a very good Muslim, so some hijinks ensue after that. Um, so that's where the title comes from. One of the main themes of the book is to um, sort of highlight how the belief systems of people don't um, reflect the value of people. Those two things aren't linked, and I feel like sometimes we, we, we lose sight of that. Um, as for Anwar uh, himself, the self-proclaimed uh, bad Muslim, uh, he, uh, the story starts when he is very young uh, in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, and his family moves to um, the States. And as Barbara said, his family moves to the States from Karachi, Pakistan, because of rising conservatism there. Um, it was really interesting because I grew up in Pakistan at that time, in that city, and um, the relationship the country had with religion changed dramatically. And it changed because of the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, uh, essentially, that war, which was opposed by the US and opposed by the Saudis, um, caused an influx of money um, into the resistance fighters against the Soviets. And so the problem with giving a resistance money and, and weaponry is that you also need people to fight. And so in order to convince people to come and fight uh, the Soviets in Anwar's view of history, um, a more conservative brand of Islam was promoted. And the idea was promoted that the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan wasn't one country invading another, but rather um, a, uh, an affront against Muslims. It was uh, a non-believing country invading a believing country. So it was built as a holy war. Um, and uh, we have seen the political fallout from that, uh, this weaponizing of religion. Um, uh, Anwar calls it the, uh, the clash and go effect, you know, sort of the butterfly effect, but for militaries where one action will have serious consequences um, that we can't predict um, later on globally. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the environment he grows up in. His father doesn't like the rising conservatism. So they move to um, the States. Um, at the same time, concurrently, um, a young woman, Safwa, is growing up in um, Baghdad and she uh, ends up fleeing the war to Pakistan. And unlike Anwar's family, her family ends up in San Francisco in 2016. Um, uh, at the same time, but illegally while the, the uh, Anwar family moves legally. Um, and so one of the really interesting things, the reason I said it in 2016 was because when the conservatism ro rose in Pakistan, one of the main issues became, one of the main questions became, why has Muslim civilization changed so much, right? I mean, uh, it was, a, they had a great empire and that sort of just has been on a decline and now Everywhere in the Muslim world, we see a lot of political issues, social issues, and why is that? And one of the answers, because the movement was conservative, that they came up with was, you know, we were great once, and if we just go back to doing what we were doing before, we can be great again. So it was like the Make Islam Great Again movement, uh, going back to um, the fundamental principles from the seventh century and, and sort of disregarding 1400 years of, of thought and, um, uh, advancement uh, socially. So um, obviously make Islam great again. I'm sure people can see the parallels with 2016 and the election that happened. So I thought that was a, a sort of a cool theme to explore. Um, and finally, I wanna talk very briefly about my inspiration for this book. Um, I finished law school uh, right after the great recession was ending. So there weren't a lot of jobs to be had and I would go on these really, um, long uh, drives with my dad, who was a very uh, stoic person. Um, <laughs> and we would be stuck in a car, um, you know, for hours driving from city to city in California, trying to find me a job. 
And one day uh, a story came on the radio, which um, something horrible that happened in a Muslim country. And he turns to me and uncharacteristically, he says, you should really do something. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I gonna do? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm an attorney. I, um, I do insurance work. I, I, I don't have any kind of ability to influence people's views or to get my own views out there. Um, anyway, my dad passed away and the world kept getting grimmer and grimmer and the news kept getting darker and darker. And I couldn't shake his, his, his voice sort of telling me to do something. Um, and so I did, <laughs> I wrote this book. Um, and so I'm hoping that it will pose some interesting questions about identity and belonging to the Muslim community. And then also show a bunch of different facets of the Muslim community to anyone uh, reading it from the outside. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's all I've got to say for now. Thank you. Thank you. And so again, great wit, but also great context for understanding, uh, whoops, for understanding the, um, we lost me. A great, under, a great context for understanding. Sorry, we lost each other and now I'm glad we're back. Okay, <laughs> great, great context for understanding some of the issues we're facing today. I took down lots of notes, some individual insights that were really terrific. And before we leave the screen, which I just did momentarily, please just take a look at the cover of the book, which I think is terrific and it's right over Syed's shoulder, right to the left, okay? Thanks very much. And our next author is M. O. Walsh, and he, we'll see about his potential as um, as an author. Let's see what. So. I'm sorry. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm turning it over to you. As I said, we're going to see what the um, the Dynamics machine says about your potential as an author. Okay. Let's okay, chat. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm okay. just, sort of, uh, just sort of bummed out that I have to talk. I was enjoying listening <laughs> so much. Uh, that last uh, thing about uh, Syed's father, and that it's uh, that's amazing. Um, uh, really happy to be on this panel. Uh, everyone is. Uh, so talented and hardworking, uh, just like everyone I know, all the uh, librarians as well. Thank you all for having me. Um, so this is my um, this is my second novel. Uh, my first one was called My Sunshine Away. Came out about five years ago. Uh, this one's called The Big Door Prize. Uh, comes out uh, in about a month from now, September eighth. So uh, very excited. Um, as y'all know, it's just. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with us writers, but we, we just put so much into these things um, and just care so much about them, uh, you know, that when it gets a chance to actually maybe hopefully find some readers, it's just really exciting. Um, anyway, so the, uh, this book is, uh, as Barbara said, thank you, Barbara. Um, it's the idea, I guess the premise behind it is, it's an idea I had a long time ago, probably more than 10 years ago. Um, I wrote a short story sort of based around this same concept and every once in a while, uh, you know, writers get lucky enough to have an idea that just sort of like never leaves them, you know? Um, I have lots of, lots of writer friends who are always walking around like writing every single idea down, uh, you know, and have all these notebooks. And I don't really do that uh, because typically I know the ones that are good, <laughs> the ideas that are good are gonna stick, stick with me. I have lots of bad ideas, trust me, uh, but the good ones sort of stick around. Um, and so what, that's what happened with this. I wrote a short story a long time ago and I'd written my sunshine away. And then I was like, man, I, I want to start on a new book. And this thing just, just wouldn't go away. And I wanted to talk more about it. And so the idea of it uh, is that there is a uh, machine that can tell people what their potential is, okay? Sort of uh, based on their DNA. So in other words, it, the, the science makes sense to me. It's like, uh, they can do all sorts of things with DNA, right? So they, you swab your cheek, you put it in this little machine. It's like a photo booth type of thing. It only takes two bucks to do it. Um, you put it in and it sort of analyzes your DNA and tells you, okay, well, this is what your sort of biological makeup says you are capable of being excellent at, right? So, uh, you know, there's all sorts of things um, that immediately would spring to mind, you know, sort of physical attributes. Like, you know, you could be a great swimmer like an, an olympic swimmer or you could be 
um, you know, a, a ballerina, you know, there's all these things. Um, but what starts happening is it's this machine shows up in a sort of small town and the potentials that it starts spitting out are a little strange, right? Some of them, uh, yeah, some of them are occupational, right? But some of them are more almost like uh, positional in society, right? So they're, they're just sort of bizarre. Um, and the people in this town, um, you know, there's enough people that start taking it seriously to where everyone sort of buys in, right? And, you know, it's, it's things like, uh, you know, if someone were to tell you, you know what, I, if the machine told you, I think you should be an entrepreneur, like I just, you know, and you read that and you say, well, I've always had, I think, pretty good ideas, but I've never really pursued them. Uh, what would you do in that situation, right? So what happens is, and I want to be clear, this is not like a sci-fi novel. That's the only thing that's sort of science fiction-y about it. This is a small town, it's set in Louisiana, a uh, southern book. Uh, that at the heart of it is a, is a love story because what happens is our main two characters uh, have been married uh, for a while very happily they adore one another um, but they both try this machine and it tells them it gives them sort of wildly disparate readouts so in other words you know they're they've been together for a long time and they have this sort of quiet happy uh, existence uh, and then the the female partner is given this really sort of far out uh, reading of what she could be, something she never ever considered, uh, and is just sort of delighted and sort of seduced by it uh, in a way. Uh, and the main character, uh, Douglas, has, is a high school history teacher. You know, everyone just thinks of him as, you know, the, the wonderful sort of benign guy in, in town that you can always count on and depend on, and, and they really like him. Uh, but he's always thought he was meant for something better. Uh, and, and, and his passion was music, right? So he, he's a, he collects jazz records, he loves music, he's always wanted to play music, uh, but just life has been, uh, you know, conducted itself in such a way he's never had a chance to pursue it. Uh, well, his readout from this machine basically tells him that he's already the best thing that he could ever be, right? Uh, and so you have these, that's the heart of the story is that you have these two, this couple that are given these sort of wildly disparate ones, and we're sort of, um, we're sort of, I hope at least, rooting for them to figure it out, right? Because the, where all this came from, I only go another minute or two. Where all this came from is a long-standing idea I've had that, like, a lot of the most talented people in the world uh, probably have no idea that they could be really talented at that thing, right? Just because of whatever sort of societal constraint has. Put on them or wherever they're they're from uh you know maybe they've never thought to pick up a banjo uh because they don't live in a place where people play banjo a lot but they might be excellent at it um it, it, it's, i've always just thought of that you know the best probably the most talented writer in the world maybe has just never thought uh or never been encouraged to sit down and and, and write a story right um so that idea always stuck with me and i started thinking about what if people were actually told what they could be great at uh, what would they do, right? Um, if you were already happy, right? Which I know librarians must be, right? They've already met their true calling, right? If you were already happy and someone told you that you should be something else, uh, would you abandon everything uh, that you, you know, that you had built that happiness upon uh, based on what something, uh, a suggestion, or would you say, no, you know what? I'm, I'm happy, I'm gonna stay just like this. Uh, and which leads to the main question of the book is, uh, you know, what if some of us already are uh, the best version of ourselves uh, that we could be? Uh, what does that mean? Are we able to embrace that uh, idea? If, what, you know, what if, what if um, we think we're not very extraordinary, but the truth of the matter is uh, we are? Um, so anyway, that, that's, that's what's behind it. The title very quickly uh, comes from uh, a lyric of a John Prine song. I don't know if y'all know the uh, musician John Prine. Um, he passed away earlier this year. Uh, he's a great uh, singer-songwriter, I think a, a total genius, uh, and the book is dedicated to him and his, uh, his very big-hearted uh, lyrics, uh, and if, you're, if you are a John Prine fan, the book has about 40 different references to him and his work all throughout. Um, if you don't know him, don't worry about it, you don't need to, <laughs> uh, but anyway, I hope the book is, um, uh, is fun, uh, it's got a little, you know, some suspense in it, uh, a big love story uh, at the heart of it. Uh, and like we said earlier, the whole point is to try to say something while being entertaining. Um, and so I hope it entertains you uh, as well. That's it. Thank you.
Thank you. And it is entertaining. And I love the dual idea of the power of suggestibility. But on the other hand, we can really look at our lives and say, but this is good. It's a nice, nice aspect of that book. So thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Barbara. Thank you. Sure. And our final speaker, our final speaker is uh, Ruman Alam. And Ruman can come on screen and tell us about your third <clears throat> novel. Um, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Before I get into my book, um, I just want to say thank you to United for Libraries and the ALA for hosting me tonight. It's really an honor to share a virtual stage. Um, I wish it was a real stage because I would love to meet Dantiel and Sarah and Emma and Saeed, um, who all spoke so passionately and eloquently about their books. And um, there's something, there's like a particular honor to me um, in being there when a debut writer gets to talk about their first book because I think that's a very special moment. And like, I just love watching that. And I feel like, um, I don't know, it's a moment that every, every writer should feel really proud of. And I love that sort of vicarious pride that I get to uh, experience by lurking on the edges of that experience. Um, and also I understand that this event normally takes shape as a tea party. And so I humbly ask United for Libraries to invite me back in 2022 for an in-person, because I think you owe me a cup of tea, because especially if it involves pastries, which I'm hoping it does. Um, and also before I get into what my book is about, I just wanna say something briefly about what libraries have meant uh, in my life. I was a guest at the Public Library Association Conference a few years ago when I was promoting my debut novel, Rich and Pretty, and I got to say this to a room full of librarians and they all nodded knowingly. Um, but when you're a nerdy gay teenager, the library is a lifeline. And I spent so much time in my local public library in the suburbs of Maryland. And I came home with stacks of whatever the uh, children's and teen librarian had recommended to me. And I remember that very clearly many years on. And as a, as a dad myself now, my kids spend so much time in our local library because I just don't have enough money to buy them enough books on their various passing fancies, whether they're cars or dinosaurs or drones or robots or whatever. And, uh, you know, I, God bless children's librarians who know how to fill libraries with the things that kids really want to know about. Um, as you may, you might have heard in Barbara's introduction, my new novel is called Leave the World Behind. It will be out in October. And it tells the story of an upper middle class white family from New York City, Amanda and Clay, and they have two, ch two teenage children. And they're on holiday in a rented house in a sort of quiet corner of Long Island, a kind of unfashionable um, sort of Long Island farmland, not like the hip, cool happening Hamptons. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of, we spent some time there on vacation with them and it's sort of this beautiful idol where they're going to the beach or swimming in the pool or making complicated meals. And on the second night of their trip, um, there's a knock at the door and they're up in this house in the middle of nowhere, so they're, it's very surprising. And it's an older black couple who are well-dressed and they have a luxury car behind them in the driveway. And they tell Amanda and Clay that they are the owners of this home, <clears throat> that there's been an emergency in New York City and that they have fled the city and didn't know where else to go. So they've come to their country house, even though they know they've rented it out via Airbnb. Um, from that moment on, the book kind of uses the conventions of the thriller. And my hope is that the reader will find the reading experience of this book very sticky, that it's the kind of book, I hope, <clears throat> that we all know and uh, that I personally really love where you stay up too late and you tell yourself, well, I'm just gonna read one more chapter. I just, I need to know what's gonna happen here. There's a weird coincidence right now as pertains to this book, because this is a book about an unknown emergency disrupting the fabric of everyday life and we're all living with disruption. <clears throat> and there's so much about the nature of the emergency of COVID-19 that we actually don't understand. This is a book about people being trapped inside of a home. I mean, here I am trapped in my office. It's a lovely place to be trapped, but I have been trapped here for quite a while now. Um, the aim of the book isn't to provide for the reader a monster under the bed or a killer lurking in the closet. What's scary in this book is what's scary in our world. It's the complex muddle that we've made of how we talk about 
or don't talk about and negotiate race in contemporary society. It's the illusion of material wealth and comfort. It's you know the uncertain nature of what we've done to the planet and climate. It's the ways that technology has rewired us and become utterly central to our lives and what that might be doing to us psychically. And my hope is that the reader experiences real fear or a real thrill, but I hope more than that, the reader will experience thinking about this moment in our lives, this moment in our history in a new way. So that's sort of my spiel. And I think we're gonna all talk, all five of us now. Yes, let's all. We're all gonna come back. Thank you very much uh, for a book that is not only relevant, but prescient. And a book yeah. that everyone I think will be reading under in shelter as we all continue sheltering. And so let's invite everyone back. Uh, if we were in an auditorium and drinking our tea or our cocktails at this point, uh, we'd all be applauding. Uh, and that, but that was for everyone a ter just a, a terrific a uh, terrific group of books and looking forward to introducing them to all of my readers as well. So uh, the first question I always get asked all the time by the audience is, so how can I get these books? Um, and I'll just, I'll just intervene to say, of course, turn to your library reps for the, for the publishers here. And also you can certainly get the galleys on NetGalley and Edelweiss and uh, and I recommend you do so as quickly as possible. And next, in just to pursue, uh, let me just pursue a theme that uh, Mom has brought up, the, the specialness of the debut novel or the debut collection, because we do have one here. And I think it's, it's particularly interesting because we actually have three debuters here. Um, and I'd like to ask each of them in turn um, about their debut experience. You've all talked about it a little bit, but maybe what was the scariest or the most fun aspect of publishing your first book? So um, Dantil, and, and the call on people, it's a little easier in this environment, but Dantil, if you could tell us first about your thoughts about um, what, was, what was the most exciting thing, the most or the scariest thing about having a first book published. So I can answer both of those with one answer. The best thing and the worst thing was that people are going to read the book. <laughs> like, you know, like, like, yay, people will read the book. And then I'm like, oh, people are going to read the book. You know, just being exposed in that way kind of is a little um, anxiety producing, but it's also really exciting. It's because this is something that I've made that I'm really proud of. I know a lot of writers get into that track of, oh my God, I hate my writing. I never want to see it again after, you know, after it's published or whatever, but I write with myself in mind, first and foremost, what would I want to read? What interests me? And so these are the stories that I would have liked to have seen. I made these stories. And so for me, I don't get like sick of my writing in that way. Maybe it'll change after, you know, I've been talking about it for another year after publication, but like, I'm just excited that, um, that it's gonna be in the world, but it is a little scary at the same time. Yeah, wait for it, the reviews are coming soon and they come before publication. That's something a first novelist I talked to didn't realize. So, so uh, it's, it'll be good, it'll be exciting. Uh, Sarah, really quickly, the scariest, most fun, Experience or most or combination. Um, yeah, yeah, Barbara. So the most fun part of this whole thing for me has been, interestingly, um, the 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 translation rights that were sold in the international territories. And the reason for that is, you know, I'm born and raised in the United States, but I'm I'm ready to 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 do and see more. I've traveled extensively and. Um, I, my husband and I would love to relocate to Europe here in the next few years. And so to see that those territories were interested and, and found value in the story and that it would appeal to readers there, that was a really exciting moment. The scariest thing, absolutely. I'm uh, editing my, my next book now. No one has seen it. I'm sending it to my agent in eight weeks and I'm terrified. Um, I feel like I have a lot to live up to. Uh, so that's the scariest thing. I just sit down at the computer each day and hope that I'm doing doing my work some justice. Okay, thank you. Uh, Syed, you you actually have a double hitter. What's that like? Um, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, the scariest thing was the same for all of them, which was 
that the local community is going to read it. And my wife was scared that, you know, uh, my family still does arranged marriages. So she's like, no one's going to want to marry our children after they read your books. And I'm like, dude, they're like six and three years old. You'll get over it. Um, but <laughs> so there's a lot of anxiety um, because, you know, uh, you don't want the aunties reading about the, the characters kissing or whatever. It just, it's, it's a bad look. Um, there's some swearing in the young adult. There's no swearing in bad Muslim because I reserve swearing for young adults only. Um, but <laughs> um, so that's been the scariest thing. The most cool thing has been, you know, when I was growing up, um, Desi culture did a lot of don't do arts, do science only. And so when I was studying uh, English literature, my mom was really on me. And, and one day I turned to her and said, one day I'm going to write a book and you're going to call all your friends and you're going to tell them my son wrote a book. Um, and seeing that actually happen, despite all odds, has been really cool. Okie doke. Thank you. All right. And now let me turn to the two veteran authors uh, with a question actually from the audience. We can start with, uh, with you two, uh, first with Emma and then Ramam. Um, someone is asking, uh, how did you stay motivated? Was it hard to stay motivated during lockdown, sheltering? How did the, what is the impact, therefore, of the um, pandemic on your writing? So, Emma, you first. Yeah, well, luck luckily I was done before this started because <laughs> I can't, uh, whenever I look on Twitter, everybody's like, oh, this is like the perfect time to sit down and write that masterpiece. I'm like, you, are you out of your mind? Like, I'm terrified. Like, I can't, how am I supposed to sit down and think about some sort of fictional world? Like, I'm, I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about, I mean, I just, it's, it's really oppressive. Um, I'm worried about everything. Uh, and so I really, honestly, uh, since February, I've written very little fiction. I wrote, like, wrote one little short story that I'll probably never let anybody see because it's like so dark and twisted, which is usually kind of unlike me. Um, and, and so I really, I really was not, uh, I was not able to produce much uh, since this has started. I mean, luckily, um, not luckily, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had a, one of my good friends and uh, mentors passed away and I was so struck by it that it's a first thing that really got me to sit down and write uh and I wrote just sort of like a little tribute to him just because I appreciated so much his mind and uh, you know and and just who he was on, on the planet and that was really the first thing that that got me to write anything uh, otherwise uh this year has been more about like huddling in a corner with my children and like not letting anyone get near them Okay. Yeah, understood. <laughs> Sorry, that's uh, not a good how, how about you? How did this? How has it? How has this affected your writing? Yeah, I would. I would echo what Emma had said. I mean, I was. Uh, the book was done uh, in February. I think we were done. I think it was sent up to the copy editor. So, what the ensuing months have been for me, I think, are what they've been for so many people, which is that it's been difficult just to keep up with the laundry and the homeschooling. Um, so to add or to, to assume the additional burden of having to um, function as an artist just feels very, it's very difficult. And I think there's um, a way in which we have been given this gift of time, for sure, right? Like I'm not wasting any time riding the subway or waiting in the dentist's waiting room or anything like that. But at the same time, there's such uncertainty and such anxiety. There's sort of an ambient thrum of it in the air as we all face wondering about how our, what our livelihoods are going to look like, the health of people we care about. Like, it's just a, you know, I think Sarah, Sarah spoke about, she's working on a book now, she's got eight weeks as a deadline to hand that into her agent. And I think that that's, it's lucky. If you happen to be deep enough into a project, I think it can be a great solace and it can be a thing that you lose yourself in. But I think it's hard to willfully lose yourself so it's hard to take the anxiety of the moment and say, I'm gonna run away from this anxiety by writing a novel. I think if it were if it were that easy, we would all have written like 15 novels by this point. You know. All right. Another question uh, we have is how the current racial equality movement has impacted your writing. Uh, and this, of course, anybody can answer this because it affects everyone. Um, does anyone want to go first? I'll say something. Um, you know, I, I had a, a podcast reviewer this week, um, a, a feminist podcaster, and she had, she gave me four stars and she said the reason she docked me for a star was because there, she felt there was not a great representation in my book. And I really took that seriously. 
And, uh, you know, it's a loaded question, Barbara, but I, I very much am reflecting on her comments. And uh, as I work on my current book and future books, that's going to change and I'm going to do better. So it's absolutely impacted me personally. Uh, uh, done to you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, being steeped in a um, patriarchal white supremacist kind of foundational country, like from birth, you know, it's it's kind of hard to detach yourself and kind of figure out like, I mean, like, you know, something's not right, but then it's, it's taken me until my late 20s and early 30s to kind of um, be able to articulate those things as the, you know, more consciousness is going around and more people are talking about it. But it's not, um, for me, it's not as if like, oh, this current moment is going to change the way that I'm writing. Like, these are things that I'm always writing towards and I'm always trying to figure out how to center my own narrative and people's narratives who look like me and experience what I experience and how to center that in my work instead of thinking of myself on the fringes. So I'm just going to keep doing that, keep moving towards my own center. And, and you know, if people want to come with me, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thoughts from other panelists in that regard? Ah, Syed, speak yeah. up. Um, so one of the luxuries of being a writer is that you get to create your own fictional world and I just don't concede the ground. I mean, I just write as if equality exists um, and gotcha. I got excommunicated recently for my YA book, informally excommunicated by some random person on the internet um, <laughs> who said, what will white people think if you, know, you, you portray Muslims who are doing bad things? And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> and so, you know, not right. You, you, you can liberate yourself, I feel, as a writer from the external gaze. And if you do that, it frees um, up a lot of creativity and space for you. Yeah, that's a great power, actually, of reading your book is that feeling comes across. So thank you. Okay. Other thoughts in this area? Hmm. I, 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 um, I am happy that there is a, rigorous institutional attention to questions about race and representation happening inside of publishing. I think that is a great opportunity for a rising generation of writers. I am cautious to point out that like those artists have always been here and have always been doing their work and like Dan, like Danielle said, like the nature of her artistic pursuit is not going to change because the circumstances of her own existence have not changed. So she will be engaged in the same artistic pursuit she has always been engaged in. And my hope for what, like how this will change, how, my hope is that publishing will actually invest in writers who reflect what the readers in this country look like and want to read. And that is, you know, it is like the, bur the burden is not on the shoulders of the artists themselves. They're already out there doing this work. I want publishing just to bring that money mm -hmm. to the table. And do you think there, you know, now that uh, there have been, uh, there's been a strong movement in publishing, do you think that will happen? There's been talk about it in so many years in the past. Do you think publishing really will change this time? I mean, I can't answer that question. I think a lot of this is generational also. I think as younger people, are promoted into those corner offices, you are going to naturally see a, liter see a literature that reflects the interests of an, a rising generation of readers. Mm -hmm. And um, there is something to be optimistic about in that. But I also am mindful of the fact that for a lot of our colleagues who are black and brown, the past few months, some of that attention, some of that institutional attention of saying like, oh, we need to have your perspective. We're desperate for your perspective. Here's $2,000, here, write us a story, whatever it is, is not really a good faith exercise. And it creates more labor for the very people who are sort of dealing with the psychic fallout of living in a society, which as Dentiel said, is sort of fundamentally designed to exclude people who don't look a certain way or don't, you know, don't slot in comfortably a certain way. So I, I'm thrilled if there are writers who can seize this particular opportunity and make a little money and maybe get a get a return, get a phone call return mm -hmm. from an editor who maybe otherwise wouldn't have. That's wonderful and that's a tangible individual goal. But I'm mindful of the fact that I don't want to just shift all of this burden onto like the 10 black writers who got a book deal in the last 18 months. Like 
I want to be thinking about like the undergraduates and the high school students who are still, you know, forming and make sure that there's a, an institution ready to look at the work that they're going to produce a decade from now. Okay. I, I would I would agree with that totally. I mean, I, I don't want to say too too much on this, but like the when you're talking to artists, I think in general about this question, you're preaching to the choir. I mean, the the the, the artists are the people who always are just flinging their hearts out to everybody and uh, who see these things, right? I mean, hopefully, and are active about these things, but what we're, what we're spending most of our time doing is making sure the sentence doesn't suck, right? I mean, the, the problem is societal. The problem is not with art. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that like, like exactly what Ruman is saying is, is if, if it's about publishing and better representation there, that's all great things, but none of that like solves the problem. I mean, the, the, the artists, I think the people who are writing and spending all their time uh, in these fictional worlds and, or even their nonfiction doing this work, um, that's, that's the choir. I mean, I, I never run across writers uh, who don't feel like there's, uh, there needs to be change in that uh, <laughs> there. I, I just never, it never happens to me. If, I don't know if y'all know them, but I don't. Um, I don't, that's it, that's all I'll say. Okay, other thoughts? I just wanna say that I was speaking a while ago to a, a a novelist saying that he got so praised for giving voice to the voiceless. And he said, well, we're not voiceless, we never have been. You know, and that assumption of voicelessness is, is more a structural problem than it is um, about writers themselves. So I thought that was a that was a that really hit me when I when he said that. So thank you. So I think let's just wrap up um, and get back to our tea uh, or whatever. But um, we've been talking about your books, all, all of you, and your writing, and just curious to know if there is a book that any of you is reading now that you'd particularly like to recommend to the audience. You're reading, not your writing. Anyone have a thought? Ah, and oh, yes. Well, I, did, I just read uh, S.A. Cosby's Blacktop Wasteland. Mm -hmm. uh, do y'all know this book? It's a crime, it's a crime uh, novel. Um, it's a African-American Appalachian writer. It's, I don't read crime novels and it reminded me of why, because this thing is so intense and great. I mean, and violent that I, th I mean, I'm sitting there, I was telling my wife, I was like, what am I doing to myself? I'm, I'm the type of person, like when I read a book, I get so emotionally involved in everybody and all these people are dying. <laughs> like they're being shot and it was like it's so intensely i mean it's it's well written and so intensely crafted uh, that it was the type of thing uh i uh i would recommend it if, if you like pain right if you enjoy pain read blacktop wasteland um it was really it was really good and effective in that way okay that's good other comments thrillers <laughs> or not pain or not roman oh. Um, I, I'm reading I'm reading a wonderful book right now called We Cast a Shadow by Maurice Carlos Ruffin, um, which is um, a really, it's just a, it's a very vibrant book full of a lot of intelligence that's really fundamentally about um, paternal love, which is, um, I don't know, there's just something very sweet. It's about, uh, it's, it shouldn't be sweet. It's sort of a postmodern um, race satire, but there's a lot of sweetness and there's a lot of like sensitivity around the paternal love that animates a book that's ultimately about black people seeking to lighten their skin. Um, it's an extraordinary book, really, really a beautiful book and I highly recommend it. Okay. Can I say something about that real quick? Uh, Maurice is one of my students at, uh, in the MFA uh, program here in, the, in New Orleans. And he, okay, so he's an incredible writer, an incredible story writer, and he had been working on this novel for so long, and I got a chance to judge uh, a contest, uh, a novel in progress contest, right? Tennessee Williams Festival does. And I, they, they sent me all these manuscripts, and I read one that was just like soaring above everything else, but they're all blind. It was a blind contest. And I had not read a word of his novel, and I just had this sinking suspicion as I was like, Oh my God! I bet this is Maurice. I bet it's Maurice because there's just something about his writing and something about his insight that was so clear and just spoke through a blind submission process. And so I, I wrote, I, I sent the festival a thing saying, "Look, I'd have to recuse myself because I think I know who the author is, right?" Uh, and I was like, "I think it's Maurice Ruffin," 
Uh, and they were like, you're right, but you know what? We're not going to recuse it because every every writer, that, I mean, every reader that it went to before that, it was their number one ranked novel out of all the things they had read. So they're like, there's no point in recusing it because it absolutely destroyed all the competition uh, in, this, in this process. It's a great book. I do hope people read it. Uh, and he's a wonderful, wonderful person. Okay. And could you just repeat the title for the audience again? Yeah, We Cast a Shadow. Sorry, Ruman, you go ahead. Right. That's a shadow. We cast a shadow. Okay. All right. Don Teal, did you have a book to volunteer? Uh, um, yeah. So this is um, How Much of These Hills is Gold. I see Pam Zhang. I know that it's been getting a lot of attention. It's long listed for the uh, Booker Prize right now, which is really cool. But um, this book, this novel kind of um, reimagines the American West to include the Asian American immigrants who came and helped like establish like what we think of as, you know, the American West and cowboys. And so it's a really great sprawling adventurous, just like amazing book. And if you can check it out, check it out. Okay. Sarah. Yeah, so for anyone who enjoys 1970s crime fiction, uh, Ruth Rendell, I just last week finished her book, A Judgment in Stone. It's interesting in that she tells you in the very first paragraph uh, who committed the crime and then spends the rest of the novel explaining the motive. So it's very deep characterization and we get to know very closely uh, why this individual did what she did. And uh, there's it, it doesn't put too much you know uncomfortable on the page um, as Mo mentioned in his recommendations. So, uh, I highly recommend it. It was written in the 70s. So it's it's a great uh, digression from contemporary crime novels. Okay. And, and Syed, I don't think we've heard from you. Um, I, I you have a book I finished you... reading recently called Radical Love by mm -hmm. uh, Omid Safi. He's um, is, is the um, compiler for this. Um, I just want to say, actually, going back to the earlier question about um, equality, the way we read and our canon is unequal. There are amazing writers and poets that, because we don't always read in translation, um, well, let me, let me say it this way, who we read in translation uh, is a reflection of how we view societies. We will read Tolstoy, but you know we won't read some brilliant authors in Africa, we won't read Arab authors or Indian authors. So um, I think that particular collection of poetry um, is, is really great. Uh, he went back to the original sources for some Sufi poetry and, and retranslated them. So that was fantastic, but I encourage everyone to read in translation because um, that is that is great. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I have five really great books to recommend that I've just spent the last week with, and I wanna thank their authors for having given us all such a wonderful time. I wanna encourage you all to rush out and get those books, not just for yourselves, but for all of your readers in your libraries. Uh, and all of these books actually would make great um, book club books and great discussion uh, books. So thank you all very much. Thank you for joining us audience. Um, thank you again authors for a, a terrific, terrific show. Great. And we'll see you. you. All right. All right, Bye -bye. thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks, yeah, that, and uh, that check well. it. it is on the Facebook page for United for Libraries. Feel free to share the video and uh, thank